have spoken of your faithfulness and your deliverance. I have not concealed your love and faithfulness from the great congregation. In the name of the one holy and living God. Amen. Good morning and, and happy Epiphany. This is the season, the season called Epiphany. Um, it's a long word, epiphany, three syllables, and it's not a word that we often use out in the world too much, and it simply means a showing, uh, a revelation, a disclosure, an uncovering of what is. That's what epiphany is, and all of the readings that we get through the season of epiphany, which is from essentially Christmas to Ash Wednesday to Lent are um, readings that have some element of surprise, of, of showing, of un unveiling a truth that might be covered up or um, concealed behind the veil of humdrum reality, of everyday reality, of hidden behind the, the aisle of this, this post we might seem to be referring to. The so it asks the question, what is? What is truth? What is real? What, what about us in our hearts is being disclosed? What about our congregation? You know, we're living in this time of, I guess, a, a charitable way of describing our current times out in the world. It's the time of discernment, right? This election period, this, this primary period, is, you know, you, I would call it a time of discernment. It's also a time of great conflict, of division, of arguing, of some tension. You may feel burdened and, and afraid at this time, but it's also a time of disclosure, of revealing, of what's, what's really, what do we really hold to be our values and our hopes and our desires um, and our love within our collective hearts. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, I had this wonderful occasion in New York Parish Hall with some other um, uh, religious leaders, and we got to meet with one of the presidential candidates. It was a small group, and there was a sort of question and answer period with this candidate. And, you know, the usual conversations, the usual questions were being asked about immigration, about the economy, about health care, about global climate change, all these things. And it occurred to me to ask this candidate one question, it was, which is, what, you know, we know your position and all these things, but what did you tell us that was in your heart? What's in your soul? Because we know, this has been studied, that uh, a leader, what's the contents of one's soul of the leader, the heart of the leader, um, affects and really determines what's going on in the broader society. Um, the heart of the leader is so crucial to finding out what's, where, where our direction, what the tenor and the shape of our society might be. And this person said, actually, it's been told to me that an election, a, a campaign, a political campaign, is like an MRI of the soul. <laughs> Which seems right. We certainly are getting a sense of what, you know, that this, it's, it's very real for us. What's in our leader's heart really has a way of disclosing and being shared and has a ripple effect on our culture. So I'm, I'm saying it's all because this is, this is the season of disclosure, of epiphany. What is being revealed, uncovered? What shows? How is your soul showing? What is your soul showing? The opening prayer that we had for Epiphany is that Jesus is the light of the world. May our lives be illumined by that light so that we, each of us, and collectively, may be a light to the world. What is that light? That's, that's a heavy burden. We can't do that alone. We need, it, we need each other's encouragement and support, sometimes challenge and sometimes rebuke but often each other's forgiveness and grace and love in order to be transformed into that light. What's in 
know, that, that advertisement that we see, what's in your wallet? No more question, what's, what's in your soul? What's in your soul? I have a, um, a prayer that I often go to. It's a, it's a poem, actually, by the late poet Galway Canal, who used to live in the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont. And the, it's a very short poem, and I think even I can remember it and I can share it with you. It's simply called Prayer, and it goes like this. You may have heard me say it before. It goes like this. Whatever happens, whatever is, whatever what is is, is what I want. Only that, but that. That's it. Whatever happens, whatever what is, is, is what I want. Only that, but that. It's a kind of a gloss on the Lord's Prayer, right? Thy will be done. <coughs> Thy will be done. And it asks for what is, is, to be revealed. What is? What's underneath all of the static and the arguing and the, the noise and the, the sort of the veil of our reality right now? What's underneath it? And how is it being, how is God disclosing it? We read from John's Gospel, and we hear the story of John the Baptist. And there's a, if you read this passage from the early part of the Gospel of John, there's a lot of pointing and indicating and saying who is who and what is what in this Gospel. John the Baptist says, and earlier he says, I'm not the Messiah, I'm not the Anointed One, this one is. Behold, watch, look who's showing up. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not me, but him. This is the one who I saw when he was baptized. The presence of God, the Holy Spirit, descend on him and remain with him. And I can testify, I can say what I saw, what showed up on that day of his baptism, which we celebrated last week. That this is the Son of God. It's a showing, it's an epiphany, a revealing of who Jesus is. Behold the Lamb of God, the Son of God. The Lamb, the Lamb, the, the Lamb of God, the, the Son of God, the Child of God. We believe that in baptism, we actually die. We actually share in the crucifixion, the suffering, and the death of Jesus, not to stay there on the cross, but to be raised. And so that death and suffering no longer has, uh, has the final say in our lives, in our, suffer, in our struggles. No matter what we experience, there's an underlying, undergirding reality, which is the resurrection, which is the life, which cannot and will not be extinguished. That's what we believe happens in baptism, which we're about to have uh, here. I wonder if the questions and the pointing out and the indicating and the new start of this, this gospel, if it asks you the question, who am I? What am I about? What's in my soul? What am I seeking? What am I longing for? Above all else, and underneath all else, around all else, what, what, is, what is the desire of my heart that God has placed there? Who am I? Because there's so much in our lives which kind of right now oppresses us and depresses us and makes us kind of our identity sort of distorted. The world kind of sees us as maybe just one boat or as a consumer of goods or as whatever, however the world sees you as a taxable event, perhaps. But we're more. We are children of God in whom God is well pleased. Even when we fall and stray away 
from that identity, from that knowing of ourselves, God calls us back to our truest self. Somebody yesterday said that he was told once that when we receive baptism or when we receive Holy Communion in the resurrection, resurrected body and blood of Jesus, that we're to see a mirror. We're to see ourselves. You've heard some of us say when we break open the bread, Behold what you are. And the response is, may we become what we receive. Not just a broken, torn piece of bread, but the resurrected Jesus. That's who we are to become day by day by day. This question of identity is really interesting. Earlier this week, I was listening to the morning um, on N NPR listening to an interview at the end of the morning show, morning edition, I think it was. And, and there was this, this interview of um, a comedian who spent many years on uh, Saturday Night Live, and her name was, um, oh gosh. Les, thank you, Les, I haven't had breakfast yet, I'm certain. Uh, Leslie Jones, thank you. It's being revealed. <laughs> heard the sermon three times, so <laughs> things are revealed. Leslie Jones is a very dynamic uh, African-American um, comedian who had some struggles growing up. She was very, very large. She was thinking, do I become a comedian or a basketball player? Um, she can be very brash, apparently. And when she first started out in her art, she was literally booed off stage. And then as she developed more success in her, in her career, she became, as is often the case in our broken, dark world, um, the target of horrendous and ugly um, uh, comments on social media, on Facebook and, and uh, Twitter. And it's just it's been virulent attacks, racist attacks against her. And she kind of, by the support of her friends and family and community, she's kind of overcome these things, rather than being oppressed and pushed aside. And what struck me about this interview was not so much the comedy, which didn't really impress me that much, but, but her, her sort of coming of herself. And she said, I can't believe, I'm amazed. She said, I'm amazed I get to be Leslie Jones. I'm amazed I get to be Leslie Jones. I wonder if those who are baptized or those who are remembering their baptism today as you walk by this pond, if you sometimes have that experience of saying, I'm amazed I get to be Sophia. I'm amazed I get to be Caitlin. I'm amazed I get to be whoever. Even when we sometimes think, oh gosh, I wake up in the morning and I'm still me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've still done these things and I still feel bad about these things, but God still calls me back to share in the sense of God's belovedness. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Over the uh, holiday over the Christmas break, my children came home, and and there was one evening when they're they're thinking, okay, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna rent a movie, and so they rented um, the Lion King, the new version of the Lion King. You've all, not many of you, have probably seen it or heard of it. The Lion King. You've heard of it. Um, it's Disney, um, but God, even God, works through Disney. <laughs> And there's this scene, my favorite scene, I've seen it a couple times, we saw it in New York, we saw the earlier version. My favorite scene remains this one. Simba is the character, the lion, who's kind of like a prodigal son. He is first embraced by his family in what's in the, the community of the, the wild kingdom called the, the pride, interesting. 
And um, he is led to believe after the death of his father that he is responsible for the death of his father. And so overcome by sin, by an awareness of guilt, by feeling like he's responsible for the, the fallen nature of the, the pride and everything, he runs off, he leaves, and escapes. And he enters this world of who cares, Hakuna Matata, right? You've heard that. Um, where he's not accountable to anyone except these, these, these funny friends, a mere cat and a, and a warthog. I've been there. I've been among the mere cats in the, in the warthog when I felt that way. And over time, he realizes that he comes to himself, just like the prodigal son, and part of what is the process is there's this other figure who is kind of a priest figure. There's kind of a spiritual go-between. Um, kind of a priest, bishop, he has, he has a staff, and of course he's a baboon. <laughs> I've been there too. <laughs> and the baboon, Rafiki, draws him at this, this is my favorite part, he draws him to this pool of water. Pool of water. Now, I think we, being Episcopalians, we're above all, we're many things. We're disciples of Jesus, but we're also metaphorical disciples of Jesus. We love metaphor. And so I think Disney and the Lion King is up to something. When the bishop and the, the priest figure, Rafiki, the baboon, with a staff, draws this wayward, errant, figure to a pool of water. Get it? <laughs> and he says, Simba, your father is waiting for you. And Simba says, what do you mean, my father? Don't talk about my father. My father's dead. He said, no, come with me. And he goes, goes to a pool of water, and with his staff, he kind of troubles the water. And he looks, Simba looks, sees a reflection. At first it's just a reflection of himself, but then he sees a reflection of his father, Mufasa, the ancestor. It could be the Kameen in a sense, but I might be reading into it too. <laughs> there it is. And he hears this voice. He hears this voice. In the early version of the Lion King, the voice said, Simba, you have become less than you are. You have become less than you are. And he says, remember who you are. You are my son. You are my child. You have always been my child, and you always will be. Hmm, where have you heard that before? And then with that, he goes and he returns to take his rightful place, to do the struggle he needs to struggle in the pride. He gets to be Simba again. He gets to be Simba again. So I, I wonder if those who are about to be confirmed, received, baptized, I pray that they will always, no matter what, remember who they are, even when they forget that by the community of faith, by the movement of the Holy Spirit stirring in their hearts, by our words and our love and support, we will help them, and we will help each other, remember who we are. Remember who you are. And we get to say, I'm amazed. I get to be that person, a child of God, forgiven, healed, renewed, and restored. May that be our